So I'm out in the garage and I've set up an experiment and I'm going to show you this mistake that people make and how to avoid it. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is to put your subwoofer inside of an enclosure that's far too small. So to show you how that works, I'm going to make three sealed enclosures, a small, medium, and large enclosure. In order to make the cutting process and the construction process as easy as possible, I'm going to make all these things as close to the same dimensions as I can. All the baffles are 12 and a half by 12 and a half, and then to get different sizes, I'm just just making the box a little bit deeper. This allows me to make all of the cuts on the table saw without wasting a lot of time adjusting the fence in between the cuts. For the experiments, I'm going to be using a 10 inch Dayton Audio Ultimax subwoofer that I picked up from Parts Express and the medium sized box is going to serve as the baseline. Parts Express gives a recommended high fidelity enclosure of 0.585 cubic feet and so the middle size enclosure is going to be 0.65 cubic feet gross internal volume. I'm adding a double baffle to this so it's going to be just a hair larger and my own calculations say that I'm going to have a QTC of 0.693 which isn't the exact same number that Parks Express came up with. They're saying this should have a QTC of 0.707. The QTC is a parameter that we use in order to quantify a sealed enclosure. The optimum theoretical QTC is 0.707. So the large enclosure is going to have a QTC of 0.707. In order to pull that off, I'm shooting for a gross internal airspace of 0.88 cubic feet. And then we have this stupid thing, this absurdly small, ridiculous enclosure. But it's not actually ridiculous because a lot of people find themselves trying to cram subwoofers behind the seats or under the seats in a pickup truck. And the small enclosure is going to be 0.4 cubic feet, shooting for a QTC of 0.862. And the small enclosure is so small that there's not enough clearance on the back. It physically fits inside of the enclosure, but the magnet has a vent on the back of it and that vent needs room to breathe. So I had to add a second baffle to this enclosure in order to space the magnet off the back wall. And in order to be consistent, I went ahead and added a double baffle to all of the enclosures. Now the Dayton Audio Ultimax is actually known to do quite well in small sealed enclosures. So this experiment is kind of a best case scenario. If any woofer can do well in the small sealed enclosures, it's one of these. And of course your actual results are going to vary based on the subwoofer that you use. Before I started the assembly process, I grabbed a Sharpie and I labeled all the pieces and lined them up and put some color coded marks on them. If you find yourself assembling a lot of things all at once in several different enclosures at the same time, taking this extra step is actually going to save you some time and it's going to prevent costly mistakes where you put the wrong piece on the wrong box or twist the piece in the wrong direction. Especially in this case because a lot of the pieces are the same dimension or very nearly the same dimension. So it's really easy just to get them confused because they all look mostly the same laying on the table. I'm always looking for tools to make life easier. I picked up some of these Milescraft corner clamps just to try them out. I think I like these better than what I've been using. I'll be sure to give you a link to them down in the video description. While I'm putting all that together, let's take a look at the predicted results in WinISD. The very smallest enclosure is predicting an FSC of 55.26. That is the resonant frequency of the woofer inside of the enclosure or the resonant frequency of the entire system. The F3 for that box is going to be about 46 hertz. You'll note in WinISD that the small box has a bump around 80 hertz. That's what happens when you put woofers in a small box. You get a bump in the upper frequency bandwidth. Compare that to the medium box here in red. The medium does not have that same hump, but it does trail off earlier and drop off slower than the small box. That's going to give it a lower F3 of about 44 hertz. And when ISD is telling me that the FSC is going to be about 47 hertz. Now the larger enclosure is going to give us a little bit more low end extension, which is why you want to use a larger enclosure. It looks to be about 43 hertz. And the FSC here is 43.58. Assembly is just glue and brad nails. Well, it was until I ran out of brad nails, but luckily I was almost done. So I clamped the last pieces together and just let it set up overnight. Here's something a little bit different that I don't usually do. I'm going to be using threaded inserts for this project because during the testing process, I'm going to be pulling the woofer in and out of the enclosures and swapping it around. I've built a ton of speakers and I hardly ever use anything more than just a good coarse grain wood screw. I find that these inserts are generally not worth the time. I typically just go full on Leroy Jenkins and just stick the woofer in the enclosure 
drill my pilot holes with the woofer in place and then screw it down. And I can literally count on one hand the number of times I've had a driver fail or an internal connection come apart that required me to pull the woofer out of the box. And the big deal with using inserts or T-nuts or anything like that is you've got to be a little bit more precise with your woofer. You really need to grab some center punches and mark out the holes. And when you're using these, it's really important that your drill goes in at a 90 degree angle. So I'm using this drill block that I picked up on Amazon. Once you get it all set up, putting in the inserts not that big a deal you just want to grab an allen key and thread it in if you're going to use these i strongly recommend you add a little bit of super glue to them i've had these things fail before and when they fail you've ruined your baffle if i had a time machine i'd go back in time and i would countersink these just a little bit i noticed that some of the inserts were sitting up proud of the surface just a little bit that's going to be a problem later when i attach the woofer because the gasket that comes stock on this ultimax isn't quite thick enough to make up that gasket so I'm going to add some gasket material after I get finished putting some roundovers on all the corners. This is the first project that I built with my new router table and this thing has been a massive time saver. I'll make sure to give you a link to the router table build up here somewhere or down in the comments or something. As far as the gasket goes, if you cover up the holes on the inserts, it's gonna make it really hard to actually get the machine screws into the inserts. So I tried several different things. I tried wrapping the gasket around the inserts. I tried cutting away the gasket. And the best thing that I found was just taking a center punch and poking a hole in the gasket right above the insert. Now for the actual test, I'm using two different tools to collect some data. The first tool is a thing called a DATS. That stands for Dayton Audio Test System. And it's just this little box that you plug into a USB port on the computer and then connect the alligator clips to your speaker terminals and you run a sweep. And there are several things that the DATS can tell you. The main thing I wanted to do was see how close my actual FSC was to the predicted FSC in WinISD. Here are those DATS results. We get an F SC of 52.8 hertz for the small box compared to the predicted 55.26 from WinISD. Now you get a big difference going up to the medium box. And of course, going to that medium box is literally a 50% increase in size. Now that resonant frequency has dropped down to 46.43 hertz. And as we jump up to the even larger box, it drops some more. We're at 43.74 hertz. What I'm hoping is that you see a bit of a pattern in the results we've seen so far, both from DATS and from WinISD. And we'll see here in a second if that pattern continues when we look at the Room EQ Wizard data. On to the second measurement. For the second measurement, I'm gonna be using this thing right here. This is a Mini DSP UMIC-1. It is a calibrated measurement microphone. You download the calibration file and load it into this free software called Room Equalization Wizard. Some people call it REW or just pronounce it RU. It can be a bit of a pain to set up, but it is actually pretty straightforward. You plug the microphone into the computer. You take the audio out of the computer and plug it into an amplifier, hook the amplifier up to the speaker, use the software to run a sweep. The software will then record the sweep and show you the frequency response of the speaker. Sorry about the background noise in that clip. Uh, they're building a new subdivision behind me and they've been pounding on rock for months. And the result looks like gibberish. You have to go into the menus and change the smoothing so you can kind of see what's going on. And if you build a lot of subwoofer enclosures, I consider a DATS an absolute must have. And the measurement mic teamed up with Room EQ Wizard is great for EQing your room or a sound quality tune for a car. And the only reason why I'm able to afford this kind of test equipment is because of the support of people like my patrons over on Patreon. So I wanna take a second to thank all of my patrons for their support with a special shout out to Dylan, Bo, Baba, and Stereo Lab LLC. I went ahead and plotted all three response curves in a spreadsheet just so it's easier to compare. And the first thing that I want you to notice is that up in the 60 to 70 Hertz range, there's no real difference. Um, in that range, I'm getting around 77 dB of output. But by the time we get to 50 Hertz, we start to see some differences. And when we get down to around 40 Hertz, we see that the small box is really running out of steam. But jumping from the tiny box up to the middle box makes a big difference. And jumping from the middle box to the larger box makes a difference as well, but the amount of that difference is smaller. And of course, as you get down to the extreme lows, those differences are really obvious. Look what's happening at 20 Hertz. 
Now down at 20 hertz, the small box is nearly 3 dB below the medium box. And remember, three decibel difference is the equivalent to a doubling in power. So that small box just really isn't gonna give you a lot of output at those really low frequencies. And the medium box does a lot better. And again, I hope you see the pattern. The pattern is going from a 0.4 cubic foot box to a 0.65 cubic foot box makes a really big difference. And if you think about it, that's a 50% larger box. But going from the mid-sized box up to the larger box isn't as big of a percentage increase in volume and you get a smaller increase in output. And of course comparing the small box to the large box the difference is kind of big, especially anything below 50 hertz. And of course, that's the pattern that I was talking about a second ago. As the box gets progressively bigger, getting progressively bigger helps progressively less. And this also shows the value of trying to find an extra 0.2 cubic feet of airspace. That really small box really is choking off your base. And so if you're trying to squeeze a box into a tight space, doing everything you can to gain as much extra airspace as possible will really help you out. And the other thing that this shows us is that relatively small changes in the box volume don't make a big difference. You've probably heard it said that beginners should begin with sealed enclosures because sealed enclosures are more forgiving. That's exactly what we're talking about here. Now, hang on just a second. Right now, it would be really easy for you to reach the conclusion that the size of the enclosure absolutely doesn't matter, but it really does. And when you get into an absurdly small enclosure for your subwoofer, the results can be terrible. And what you need to consider is what the data I've shown you isn't showing you because this data is comparing three sealed enclosures. What we really need to do at this point is pop into WinISD and show you what happens if we had put this in an even larger ported enclosure, which is what we're gonna do right now. This green line is a 1.5 cubic foot ported enclosure that's been tuned around 25 Hertz. And what you're gonna see is that all three of these sealed enclosures really underperform. And this is the reason why ported enclosures are more popular than sealed enclosures. Ported enclosures can give you more output and give you more low end extension. And when you look at it from that context, you can see just how much base you're losing by going into that super small enclosure. Now, of course, a lot of people say that a sealed enclosure is the best for sound quality. And in exchange for that sound quality, you give up a lot of output. So you have to decide for yourself which you'd rather have. In my opinion, the only time you should be using a sealed enclosure is when you have a limited amount of space for subwoofers. And even then, you should probably look into a passive radiator enclosure to see if you can regain some of that output. To learn more about passive radiators, click right up here. I am Justin, and this is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel. If you enjoy this type of video, click right here to subscribe. And I will see you on the next adventure.